our first presenter. There he is, Eduardo Garcia Molina. He's a classics PhD student with a specialization in ancient history at the University of Chicago. His research largely focuses on the Seleucid, Seleucid excuse me, empire and greater trends in the governance of ancient states and infrastructural power. He's currently working toward his dissertation, which will tentatively deal with the interconnected role of that information, administration and communication, um, the role that all those three things had on legitimizing Seleucid state power among its heterogeneous population. Um, his paper today is entitled Hellenistic Empires, Population and Cultural Assimilation in Grand Strategy Video Games. Eduardo, let's, let's please welcome Eduardo. Many thanks, Dr. Curley, for that introduction, and of course to my panelists for some really wonderful papers. I'm looking forward to discussing them. I apologize, I'm not in the best environment. I had to leave home, uh, head home for the holidays early, so I'm at my abuela's, hence why she decided that, hey, why not have the Christmas tree in the background? She's very proud of it, uh, so she's very emotional that it's in the background there. So I apologize if you hear some background noise or anything like that. Um, for the sake of quickness, and because I have a tendency to ramble on if I'm not chained to a script, I wrote down a little just summary of my presentation. So I'm just gonna read off of that just so that we can get uh, better started on the conversation and I hit the main beats of my presentation. Um, so apologies that I'm reading off of the script. Um, in a nutshell, my presentation is interested in the ways that grand strategy games translate culture into game mechanics. I opted to examine Hellenistic empires within this system, not only because my research is centered on the Seleucid, so a very selfish reason, but also because many uh, share traits that directly interact with these culture mechanics. While grand strategy games have shown progress in attempting to flesh out the variety of cultures that existed in the ancient world, the interactions between cultures available to the player are still largely constrained by these mechanics that paint differing cultures as inherently antagonistic and diametrically opposed. The player is encouraged to actively assimilate other cultures, a process that is underscored by a variety of factors like negative penalties to local public order, an inflexibility in cultural overlap, anachronistic notions of national culture and religions being grafted onto ancient polities, difficulty scaling to limit player expansion, and in some cases, cultural restrictions that do not allow buildings of other cultures to be built or even to coexist. Um, I then quickly note how cross-cultural interaction is a continuing discussion being tackled by Hellenistic scholars and I even use the famous example of Antiochus I's restoration of the Temple of Nabu as an instance of such interaction, a direct antithesis to the cultural building restriction in something like Total War Rome II. I end by reminding that these games have made considerable strides in representing the sheer variety of cultures in the ancient world, but the interactions between these cultures, which are formative in the emergent narrative of the player and affect the ultimate picture of antiquity, are still problematically constrained by these game mechanics. A reminder that we must not only examine the visual representation of the ancient world in these games, but the underlying game mechanics that attempt to translate uh, very complicated processes like cultural interaction and add just as much, if not more, to the ultimate impression of antiquity presented to the player. Um, so yeah, that's the, what I had written up just to summarize it. All right, uh, thank you, Laura. That was a model of concision. Um, your dissertation advisors must be very proud. <laughs> um, that was wonderful. And I hope that there will be some questions about that um, because the, the grand strategy games are really interesting. That's sort of that older model that we think of when it comes to the games. almost like a tabletop format, but interactive. So um, why don't we move on then to our next panelist. Um, he is David Serrano um, from the University of Santiago de Compostela. And here is his bio. Let's see. Okay. All right. So David is a PhD student at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. His research interests include Latin epigraphy and classical reception in contemporary popular culture. You're in the right place. David's publications in both areas include analysis on provincial constructions and Roman epigraphy in Northwestern Spain, as well as classical reception in cinema and video games. He also belongs to the project 
A-N-I-H-O or, an, or Aniho for classical reception in contemporary culture. Um, Davi, please take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Curley, for that presentation. And um, thank you so much to all of you for, for the opportunity of being here and being sharing with all. Um, I have been a little bit later than Eduardo, and I have stick only to one video game, and I'm going to share a little presentation to all you all so you can enjoy images and forget about the quality of my voice today. So just one second. There we go. Um, as you can see, I'm going to, to talk about uh, uh, just one game, The Forgotten City, which is actually a very, very recent title. It was released no sooner than July this very year, 2021. It is the first work by modern storyteller, a uh, fresh uh, studio in Australia. And um, I am basically bringing it today here because I think that there is a very, very interesting uh, contribution and proposal in this video game in the field of cross core reception essentially for two reasons. First of them is the format, because as probably all of you know, we are very, very, very used to playing video games, uh, the big activity on uh, three very typical formats, which are the paramount ones, the strategy of which Eduardo, of course, is, is teaching us today a lot, uh, city building, city construction, a little bit classic when it comes to build your own Roman city, and also third person or first person action adventures which of course are probably the, the most dominant and the most abundant ones. But in the case of the Forgotten City, we are talking about a very, very different story. This game is basically a first person, half uh, adventure, half RPG, half mystery solving, half sci-fi time traveling adventure, in which we are going to have to deal through a very, very peculiar scenario, uh, not real, uh, non-historical from one city, some 2000 years ago and which uh, we are going to discover very thoroughly later on with uh, Alex and Hamish and Kira in a live stream gameplay. But in this very mysterious city of which I am not giving you any more detail in order not to spoil the, the future presentation, we are going to have to solve the mystery of how to stay from there and get back to our own time, essentially by interacting, playing and discovering, researching and speaking with a lot of people, discovering this community of Roman people who is stuck there and with the very classical use of features of um, interacting, reading, hitting, threatening, and so on, but leading to a very different way of depicting antiquity in video games as from the ones we are used to for different reasons. First one, and probably the most striking one, sorry about that, is the, is the lack of brutal force, so to speak. Actually, there is a very interesting initial message by, from, by the, the creators at the beginning of the game in which they are strictly indicating that this game is enhancing uh, exploration and conversation rather than brute force. And also the game, we can see that there are different features and dynamics that are precisely restricting the use of violence, which is quite interesting because this game is coming from a very much um, different game, a different environment from the one we are used to in antiquity depiction. This game was originally created in 2016 as a mod for Skyrim but it was probably one of the most successful mods for Skyrim ever created because it had over 3 million downloads and it won different awards in all through Australia. So it went on to, to become a standalone game. And uh, this is also very interesting in terms of classical reception because the second big factor of difference is the authorship of this game. It was literally created by three people, which we, we can get very familiar with if you watch the presentation because they were literally the director, programmer and art designer who were responsible for taking all the decisions in, involved in this game. And that is precisely one of the reasons that I think to be paramount uh, when it comes to making it different from what we have seen time and again. There is a very typical and classical identification of the elements that make uh, um, build up authenticity in a video game, like replicas or references to very well-known elements or even self-explanatory menus, kind of uh, educative style, but there is also a very interesting factor of building up and creating the very little narrative and the very gamification of elements, even building up the very well of it, taking the elements from the sources, whether material or literary, and building on them as the very bricks of the world for this game. So they are not simply imitating, but taking whatever it's written or whatever is exposed in archaeological diggings, and they are bringing it in as elements that are building up the very plot, the very story, and even the interactive narrative elements. But of course, later on, you're going to see it in life. 
So I think that's good enough for my voice for a moment. All right. Thank you, David. And thank you again for being so generous with your time. Um, yes, and please do note that the live stream that David mentioned is going to take place at one o'clock today. Um, and I might as well mention now that the main presentation will be taking place on Twitch, but you don't need a Twitch account to sign on or to sign on and watch the game. We have the link provided in the dynamic program so you can get to that. However, if you don't have a Twitch account and you want to ask questions or make comments, um, we will have a concurrent Zoom feed running lives and that will be monitored in case um, people want to ask questions and they're not on Twitch. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, it's a, a fascinating game and I think we're all going to enjoy the playthrough. Um, but of course, we'll have questions about it in the way you see it, Davi, um, coming soon. All right, let's move on to our third panelist. Um, she is Ekaterina Boot, and I will now read her bio. Okay. Ekaterina received her BA in classical philology from the Russian State University for the Humanities in Moscow and continued her studies in the U.S. She earned her PhD from the Ohio State University in 2021, congratulations, and is now a postdoctoral fellow at the School of Philosophy and Cultural Studies of the National Research University Higher School of Economics in Moscow, in Russia. Ekaterina's research interests include archaic Greek and Hellenistic poetry, interconnections between Greek philosophy and literature, human theory, and reception studies, particularly, as I think her paper speaks to today, classical receptions in Russia and the Soviet Union. Um, so, Katarina's paper is entitled Ancient Aliens and Soviet Science in the Animated Film Phaethon, Son of the Sun. Katarina, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to do a very brief summary of my paper uh, to remind everybody uh, what was going on there in this film. Um, animation film Phaethon, the Son of the Sun, entitled Film Hypothesis, is centered around the narrative of the Greek myth about Phaethon, son of Helios, who drove his father's chariot with disastrous consequences and was struck by Zeus's lightning bolt. The film presents a hypothesis about the planet Phaethon existed between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, the destruction of which supposedly led to the formation of the asteroid belt. The film features a complex narrative frame uh, an expedition um, of the spaceship Phaethon 1 with a mission to find the origins of the asteroids in the asteroid belt, the myth of Phaethon and the depiction of the inhabitants of the planet Phaethon visiting Earth in the distant past. In my talk, I focused on the three interrelated aspects that are important for understanding of this film in its cultural and historical context. First, I examined how the creation of this film was influenced by contemporary Soviet science and science fiction. Second, I discussed how ancient astronaut theories and theories of paleocontact influenced the conclusion of the film. And finally, I argued that the film addresses geopolitical anxieties of the Soviet Union in 1970s. The hypothesis that is discussed in the film is inspired by the myth of Phaethon, particularly the way it is adapted in Plato's Timaeus, as, quote, an ancient poetic evidence about real events. At the same time, it reflects the actual scientific hypothesis that were proposed by Soviet astronomers and astrophysicists in 1950s. The film proposes two main versions uh, of the destruction of the planet Phaethon. The first version is that the planet was inhabited by an advanced civilization and was destroyed by the nuclear explosion. Second, that the Phaethon collided with another celestial body or was destroyed because of the gravity of Jupiter. The film explains that Phaethon wasn't destroyed by the nuclear war of advanced civilization, not because the existence of advanced civilization in solar system is scientifically less probable, but because, quote, on Earth, we had not reached this point. Humans managed to prevent the madness of destruction. High intelligent intelligence is incompatible with war. The epilogue of the film shows the landing of Phaethonians to prehistoric Earth and their meeting with early humans, suggesting that the, the development of civilization, oops, sorry. Yes, the development of civilization on Earth was impacted by alien visit. In my talk, 
I demonstrated that conflation of scientific discourse and science fiction in the film reflects the interrelations between science and science fiction in contemporary public scholarship, literature, and cinematography. I discussed influential work by Josef Szklowski and Carl Sagan, written 1962-1966, that offered the idea of palae contact in more scientific context. Uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey of 1968, article in the scientific journal Zimla and Selenaya by Vadim Bronstein, 1971, and the series of science fiction novels by Alexander Kazantsev with the title Faete that was published between 1968 and 1971. I also demonstrated that the depiction of Pythonians in the film is a direct reference to prehistoric art in Tassili Najir as evidence of paleo contact that is featured in the West German documentary by Harald Graham with the title Chariots of Gods of 1970, based on the book Chariots of Gods by Swiss amateur writer Erich von Däniken. I demonstrated that the film Phaethon, The Son of the Sun, employs some rhetorical strategies typical for alternative science books and TV shows, particularly in plot hypothesis, the interpretation of ancient artifacts as a representation of extraterrestrial presence on Earth based on visual associations and without any consideration of historical and archaeological context. In conclusion, I argue that the film Phaethon, The Son of the Sun, includes the elements of pseudo-archaeology as the reflection of the present. The film communicates the pacifistic, um, the pacifistic message that responds to the fears caused by Caribbean crisis and the Cold War and addresses the anxieties about the future of human race on a planet without nuclear weapons sorry, with nuclear weapons. Mythological Phaethon losing the reins of Helios' horses becomes a metaphor for the uncontrollable use of nuclear power. The key to the understanding of the film is the explanation of the impossibility of the nuclear war on the planet Phaethon. High intelligence is incompatible with war. The film promotes a more positive view on humankind as moving towards peaceful progress. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, why don't we thank our, our, our presenters um, for that round of summary. Um, very, very good. Thank you so much. A little bit of virtual applause from everybody. All right, so we'll throw um, things open to, to questions. Some questions have been trickling in over the chat. Um, and I encourage you again to submit questions to me and I will do my best to get them to the panelists. Oh, I should also add that I clearly did not give the paper a title, uh, the title of Abby's paper. So I'm going to do that now. This is a good title. What is a Roman like you doing in a place like this? The Forgotten City, Antiquity, and Video Games. My apologies. Uh, to all my uh, moderators following after me, please do better. All right. So uh, I think our first question is for Eduardo. Eduardo, I'm synthesizing two questions here, both of which um, ask you to project a little bit about um, what is possible in these sort of large strategy games, right? So um, let's see, how do you feel about the way that Rome two total war armies try to represent um, cultural integration, for example? Um, the Sully kids have access both to Diadochian as well as Persian units. Um, and the, the, the commenter, the question asker says that they personally enjoy this more than the simple cultural religion stat in the grad campaign map. So we're looking for nuance there. Um, and that is uh, also going on in the second question that I'd like to read to you. You claim that despite inherent difficulties in adapting ancient culture uh, as video game mechanics, progress is being made in newer games to reflect the multicultural nature of the ancient studies. So could you give an example of games that um, depict ancient cultures with more nuance, right? Both of those questions seem to be related. Yeah, I think I can knock out two birds with one stone. Um, so when, when I talk about advancement, uh, uh, I fixate on, for example, Imperator Rome, how you can integrate cultures into the inner workings of your state. So you can actually integrate, um, forget the, the broad, very broad categories that they give, but you can integrate Babylonian elites when you're the Seleucid monarch. So there is some semblance of nuance in newer games. And again, these differ based on developer philosophies, the general structures of games, but you do see even a jump from Rome Total War to Rome Total War II, you do see instances where, for example, 
in Mesopotamia, if you're a certain culture and you take over Mesopotamia, you can build specific structures that are based on the region. Like I think you can build like a Persian trading outpost or something, as opposed to just some blanket uh, 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 buildings only uh, afforded. But these are very limited. So progress, but with a bunch of asterisks uh, in front of it. And you're totally right in pointing out um, that there is an emphasis because these games are about management, but they're also about conducting warfare. And that's the main impetus, the main drive. You can build tall, which is an expression used to kind of build up your infrastructure, not really expand, but eventually you do have to expand and the games know this. So they place heavy emphasis on, on the war making aspect of it. And you do see noticeable trends in recruitment of local troops from local regions. For example, in Imperator Rome, you have to integrate uh, Eastern, again, I use this with a bunch of Eastern cultures to be able to recruit units like mounted archers. If you just stick to Hellenistic culture and you don't integrate local elites like that, you can't recruit those specialized units. So there is some sprinkle some folds, some things, uh, but it's mostly based on your ability to recruit units instead of like recruiting local administrators to like get a temple to do the administration for a region, which is a trend that you see time and time again in ancient polities. You see them use local forms of authoritative power and they kind of co-opt them into their administration. That's the way that they communicate. Uh, uh, that's the best way to articulate power. You use value sets that are already present. Um, and yeah, a similar thing in Rome Total War that the Seleucids actually have a faction trait that allows them to levy more regional troops uh, from their vassals. And that's a problematic aspect how they depict vassals, but I'm not gonna get into that because I can easily write another paper on that. Uh, but I, I hope that that hit both questions. Uh, it seems like, like you did, um, although um, your fellow panelist David has a follow-up I think he'd like to ask. Yeah, it's just that I'm taking a chance because this is very much uh, coincident with the question. I, I couldn't help thinking myself when watching your representation, Eduardo, and I think it's, it's interesting because when you are talking many times about this uh, stamp zero game that feature is, is set up as a gamification dynamic, sometimes I wasn't able to, to stop thinking about the, the games in the previous generation, this is strategies one, especially the early installments of civilization and all that in which uh, basically a culture was a monolithical thing. When you conquer a territory, the territory automatically changes its color, its flag, its tendency, its buildings. So uh, now I wonder if the, this uh, apparent improvement in the, in the you know, sophistication of the depiction of culture has more to do with the fact that developers have found in culture another way to add another layer for a little bit more complex dynamic. But at the end of the day, this sum zero is uh, inherently impl implying that the ideal depiction of an ideal culture for your game is to make it a one single culture. And this is always my perception when I'm playing to, I mean, last installment of civilization or of any strategy game. Sí, exactamente. And that's tied to this no this this anachronistic notion of a nation state that, that right? Uh, you see time and time again, if you go to the Total War Reddit or something like that, players put up their final campaign and the map is just painted their singular color. So there, yes, uh, you're totally right. And developers frequently implement these game mechanics. You kind of see if you change the difficulty settings before a campaign, you see that a lot of the times things like culture are the things that get changed to kind of stunt player growth and force them to develop a region but the problem is that this gives that narrative, right? This like colonial, this ization narrative that's so problematic and that can so easily steamroll. So you're absolutely right um, that, uh, it, and this is why I picked grand strategy games above say like civilization or something, because there's certainly trends like that, um, but they handle culture a little bit differently. Uh, this paper actually spawned from me looking at faction traits in just strategy games overall, including like 4X games like Civilization and how like 
historiographical components that we see in Greco-Roman authors, how they depict peoples, the characteristics that they give are then kind of like squeezed into these like, not caricatures, but these like portraits, these like, oh, the Romans get plus one to manpower, like these little, and I've had a lot of, um, uh, um, I've had a lot of, of positive remarks from students when I taught like gen ed Roman courses, where at the end, when we talk about historiography and how the Romans and the Greeks portray nation states, then we talk, look through faction mechanics and how they're portrayed. Um, but you're totally right that, um, there is also an added layer of developer uh, awareness of how to stop the player, how to force them to take care of their regions that they already have. Um, and this tends to then incorporate this notion of, oh, we have to have one monolithic culture uh, because then the people will be content, the, they won't rebel, and then the player can continue forward and then keep on steamrolling like that. You're, you're totally right that there's an artificial nature to it uh, that we also have to uh, think about. Yeah. Oh, all right. That's fine. We love it when our pets visit. Um, true here in a conference as it is in the classroom. So um, I think I'm going to go to uh, Katerina for a question. Um, thanks for providing this illuminating historical concept, context for this film. Question is about audience. Who do you think was the intended audience for the film? Was it children? Was the intent perhaps to showcase Russian advances in, spa in the space program in the context of the space race with the US or the moon landing? Things to that effect. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, about the space program. I just didn't have enough time to talk about that. But of course, this is the react. This is. Uh, um, the conceptualization and thinking about uh, the space race and the achievements that were made in 60s and in 70s. Um, and honestly, uh, the poor, like when the film begins, you have the portrait of Gagarin. You have the picture of, the, of Earth and then the por portrait of Gagarin when, uh, when the film just starts. So it is definitely um, uh, inspired by that. And about the audience, uh, Russian animation is very um, interesting phenomenon because it is often directed to different aud audiences, different age audiences. It, can, it directed to children or young adults as well as um, as well as uh, to um, adult audience, uh, because uh, Russian animation, especially of 60s and 70s, possess like some kind of heteroglossia, this double language that um, includes some, you know, entertainment, educational elements, and at the same time, it reflects some ideologies that are um, contemporary uh, for that time. If I um, uh, did answer the question. Yeah, and I, I haven't been saying who the questions have been coming from, but maybe we should do that. Um, there's no reason to keep it anonymous. They're just sort of coming to me this way, but I, I'll, um, I think we can institute that as a practice. So thanks for the suggestion, Meredith. Um, so I'd like to, um, Katarina, I'd like to stay with you just for another moment. Um, in your talk, you did, and this is from me, um, but you did uh, mention that the film was part, it was the first in the series and also the last in the series. And I'm just wondering if there's any inkling of what kind of what, what it might have come next, if, if you know, because um, sometimes production plans are made public. So I don't know because I did not have time to dig into archives and do all of this very complicated work uh, to find out that, but there is definitely no, um, no other elements of this series. And the director of this, um, this animation film is actually known more as an actor. His main occupation, um, is actually uh, he, he he has been an he had been an actor in many Soviet films, including the most famous. He he was the Russian uh, Sherlock Holmes 
this is one of the most uh, famous, one of the best adaptation of Sherlock Holmes. And um, the actor who played Sherlock Holmes, he is the director of this animation film. So he had other things to do and apparently just um, was dropped. The series was dropped at this. I haven't found any evidence that there were other um, uh, episodes, unfortunately. Oh, that's, that's too bad. It makes you wonder where they might have gone with, with the project. Um, well, thank you um, for, for, for trying, uh, for, for humoring me in my, my question. Um, let's turn to a question for uh, David. Uh, let's see, I have to scroll through and find it. Here it is. Um, it's from Alexander Vandewal. Um, what do you think are the primary lessons um, other and so-called future antiquity video games can or should learn from the Forgotten City? Well, that's the, the, the problem of education and, and video games is always so twisty and complicated. Personally, I am a little bit on the skeptic side of the river, but uh, personally, I think that this video game responds to one of the very few titles uh, depicting antiquity that I consider to be quite useful, not because they are teaching by themselves. I mean, I sincerely believe that there has never been any, let's say, mainstream video game that has ever been created to be good directly for education just by depicting it or showing it to students. But I think it's a very, very good tool to trigger questions and curiosity. Actually, I kind of hinted in the presentation, but I think that this game is basically a very good tool in case you want to tease students to ask the uncomfortable question that is leading you to a very good explanation. Because they are not uh, playing the classical distraction game of making it a very big show with a lot of uh, fancy uh, cinematics or animation leading you to want to play more, but it's really encour encouraging you to to wonder about. So basically, even when I was walking through um, different settings and such, I couldn't help thinking, um, is this real? Is this solid? Was this uh, like any based on any kind of solid uh, documentation or is it just an invention? So even as a, as a specialist looking for the line between tale and, and historical base is, is quite interesting. Actually, in a hit and me to to read uh, some one or two articles. So I can imagine that even for students, it can be quite a very good tool. Thank you, David. We'll, we'll stay with you too. Um, in fact, I have a question. Um, during your presentation, you mentioned that, um, in in some sense, the the world of the game provides um, provides players with nuggets of of literature, nuggets of history, um, pieces of material culture, right? That 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 you know can be you know studied within the world of the game. But I'm also wondering about the um, the role of, of of possible research outside the game. How, how does the game invite the, the the player to become a kind of scholar in order to navigate this this Roman this lost Roman world? Question. Actually, uh, I have I always thought uh, theoretically when I started studying classical reception that uh, the more accurate any depiction of antiquity uh, is, the the more it gets you closer to to being curious. But at the end of the day, I have discovered that. Time after time, you ask people in my generation or younger people, and they just get interested into antiquity because of things like Gladiator or, or I don't know, Rome, HBO. So it doesn't really need to be accurate to be uh, teasing. But I must say that in this case, this video game is different for a reason, and it's that um, you really need to get into the, the historical part to progress. Normally, and I'm sure that uh, playing this video game, a lot of people will keep in mind Assassin's Creed because it's a very natural contrast. And I will say that when you're playing something like that, uh, it is very possible to go through Egypt, ancient Greece and such, and basically just enjoy the blade, the fighting, the researching and so on. But in this game, it's literally impossible to go on if you don't give a one, first or second thought on the historical, the even the archeological element, basically to question what is going on historically, not simply in the interrelationship of characters, which is quite brand new. Thank you. You did also mention cheating. How how is it how is it possible to cheat within the world of the game? I was just curious. Yeah, actually, I was very surprised with that. It is because uh, essentially, I, I just included that because uh, there is a, a time loop dynamic here, which is actually not very common in video games because it's very difficult to keep the the tailing and the history telling with a time loop in a video game. The most difficult one is saving and restarting, but here it goes on. And there are ways, and I am not spoiling anything. Actually, the, the, I was speaking with some of the developers and they encouraged me, please, not to spoil anything if I give up my presentation. So here we are. 
and um, but uh, you can use this time loop dynamic uh, in order to force the system or to skip a step in the in the progression. Actually, I did in my first gameplay because at some point you just realize that if you do this or that, because we have that this possibility, you can simply dodge some other problems. I just leave it there. But yeah, this is interesting because normally video games are either apparently linear or either apparently open, but at the end of the day, they are bringing you down the hallway. But in this case, you have quite a lot of agency, something very curious. Nice, thank you. Um, let's go back to Ekaterina for uh, another question. Um, this comes from uh, Eduardo, your fellow panelists. Uh, he'd like to know if you could please talk a little bit more about Russian reactions to events like crisis in the Caribbean. Here we always get told the US perspective, but uh, he and we are all curious about the reactions um, that, um, that shaped the film and the message of the film. That's a great question. Thank you. Unfortunately, I'm not a Soviet historian, uh, so I don't know details. But honestly, from my perspective, of com completely uninformed perspective, it's kind of mirrored. Um, uh, the the American one, including preparation for uh, for the worst, and uh, the training uh, uh, and the training uh, for the nuclear bombing, and of course a lot of uh, ideological and propagandistic um, materials against um, against uh, the U.S. in general. That's that's what I can say for that. Maybe, um, uh, yeah, maybe I should uh, look at the bibliography on that better. Yeah. I will share it with you right. whenever I have a chance. No, I think that that's that's fair. Um, David has a question for you as well. What were, what are the channels of in, of distribution of animation titles like this within the Soviet Union, and what what's the what is their overall impact and legacy? Uh, so the animation films like that were often shown in movie theaters. Um, and sometimes separately and like in series of, of, of several animation films or before the main featured film. So people who would go to the movie theater to see whatever um, um, film they were going to see they could uh, they could watch the animation film before i had a crazy idea that maybe this anima animation film was shown before the documentary chariots of the gods but i don't know how to how how to check that uh, i i need to ask people who know how to do that probably we, we will never know but it's possible because um, that's how the animation films were distributed. Later on, it was shown on TV. So I would even in my childhood in 90s, uh, I would see it on TV. That is fascinating. I would have I would have guessed it was the other way around. But um, yeah, interesting. Very interesting. Um, so here's a question from the president. Um, and it's for all three panelists, from Meredith. Um, and along the lines of what I was thinking too, if I were to ask a larger question, but a much better phrased, all of your papers spotlight the porousness of the notional line distinguishing historical fact from fiction, or even fantasy when it comes to world building. Um, so here's the question, have you, or ha has anyone to your knowledge looked into the effect on viewers and players of blurring this conceptual line as a matter of reception? Um, or have you yourselves experienced this slippage as a viewer or a player, right? So this is really for, for all of you. Um, let's see if anybody wants to take a stab at that. If you don't mind, I can just open the fire. Sure, please. Okay. Um, okay. In this case, I have focused a little bit more on the on the creator side and on the on the players and uh, reception side. That uh, from from previous works and previous analysis on the on the impact of games on 
actually not as so much the students as a general audience in terms of historical understanding. I have discovered it's very interesting that when it comes to video games, uh, there is this very this phenomenon, uh, probably, well, I don't know if everyone would share it, we can discuss about it, but I think that many times, even the, in the most fantastic settings or in the most fantastic stories, the fantastic element, it's very much like taking for granted or even ignore when it comes to the depiction of history, and uh, many things are basically assumed that they were so. Maybe it has to do with the typical marketing campaign coming from the studios, uh, talking about how much and how thoroughly they were researching and how many sources and how many advisors they used to reach, which is true to some extent. But uh, most of players and gamers that I have uh, spoken with about their perception of history in, in video games, whether friends or acquaintances or not, generally uh, indicating their questions and their assumptions about what they have seen in video games is that they were basically believing as historical, as something really happening at some point in history, what they were watching, whatever it was. Um, it, didn't, it doesn't matter if it's the most typical commonplace from, I don't know, gladiators always dying in the arena to was there really a monster in Minotaur's Labyrinth? A question I have here many times. So I think at the end of the day, gamers ignore the fantastic element and give a lot of credibility to, it, to, to historical video games. That's interesting. Um, would any of the other panels like to respond to the question or, or play off of what, spin off of what Dave David was saying? Yeah, if I could, if I could pile on. Um... I don't. I didn't directly reference it in my slides, but I included a picture of it. There's a. So the thing with strategy games is that they drop you off at a specific date, right? Two seventy one, and then they play the historical reality of that date. But the minute the player takes control, the the reins are given to the player. Then is the the line starts blurring as the game has to, the player is kind of a centrifugal force and and the the world gravitates around them and their decisions. So for example, it's this it, a weird blending that legitimizes the game more and more. So uh, the screenshot had a player playing as the Antigonids and they ended up taking over Judea and they also experienced the Hasmonean revolt as the Antigonids. So it's it's. Again, the lines blur, but the, the developers always seek to include these kind of anchor points, these, these events, these triggers that kind of bring the player back into a, a historical narrative. So again, yeah, to, to further add on to that, there is this give and take, and the game exploits that because they know that certain regions have a particular history that the players might know. So they include events in these games that uh, influence the narrative of the players. So yeah, it's this back and forth, this ping ponging, uh, which I think is why it makes it so interesting uh, as a thing, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I might be muted. No, I'm not. Um, I would tend to agree. I mean, th there's something, it, paradoxically realistic about gaming, isn't there? I mean, there, there's uh, everything we do as scholars, for example, is a kind of reception, even if we don't want to really acknowledge it at the end of the day. Um, but when you get into a kind of ludic reception, um, paradoxically for me, that has always felt much more real than the kind of work that I do, the serious work that I do in trying to reconstruct an author or a text or their time period or their context. Um, so, I mean, I've experienced that as a player myself. Um, let's see, we have about roughly 10, 12 minutes left since we had a few opening remarks. We can keep going with a few questions. Um, Eduardo, how about a question for you? This is from David Delbar. Um, what game mechanics could future developers include to make Imperial conquest and management more accurate besides building from other cultures and using their military units? So first of all, hi, David, he's a colleague. Uh, uh... And he did not send me this question in advance, but I've been pondering this because I knew this question was going to get asked. This is one of those like shower questions where you think about like forever. Um, so there's a couple of things that um, I think, and I'm going to tackle these based on the games because they have slightly varying game mechanics. So I think it's better to do it by game by game basis. But for instance, I, I, I think that allowing the player to build buildings of different cultures in like Rome Total War II and not penalizing the player for having a varied population made up of different cultures. Maybe like just a simple subtraction of the negative order penalty because it is like the biggest thing, one of the biggest, unless you like raise your taxes to ludicrous levels. Uh, but even then, 
if you raise your taxes, if you have all populations of your um, culture, they they will more easily like they won't rebel, uh, they won't get as pissed at you if you raise the taxes. So there's still incentivization there. So I think just like a, a region by region basis might be just one of the simplest ways. Um, for example, if you're the Seleucids and you take up Babylonia, you don't have to build, you can, you can infl- You can build your little temple to, I don't remember the gods, I think one was Athena, so I'll use her as an example. You can build your little temple to Athena, but you can also have your little temple to Nabu. I, everybody, like, there, there are ways to, to represent without having to emphasize this singular monolithic thing there are ways to incentivize the player into a like a closer approximation of the realities of ancient governance that do take in mind people's lived experiences before the state comes in uh, stuff like that um and yet or maybe the introduction of a common culture a third culture that's a common culture or something along those lines, just something to to get away from that diametric opposition of us versus them and allow for some negotiate, some cultural negotiation to go on and some coexistence to go on um, more than we see already. Um, I mean, again, the paradox games are, they're so complicated and they do examine some of these realities, but still, uh, I think there there are some ways, there are some stop gaps that are still within the parameters of the game. So again, I'm not a developer. I'm not privy to the production thing. So I always want to do an asterisk on that. I'm saying this as a, a very enthusiastic participant in it. Um, but I can see that working within the systems. I don't think it's that big of a stretch uh, within the already existing game mechanics or anything like that to allow for that. Yeah. That would be interesting because a common culture would take away some of that zero sum, right? Um, you know, us, us or them, right? If there's like a third party involved um, or a way of sort of bringing people together rather than just overriding them, which seems to be the dominant mode. Um, a question for, for Katarina from, from Meredith, but in a sense, it comes from everybody who remembers your film and history presentation from two years ago in the before times. Um, how is this Phaethon film related to the film about Prometheus that you've spoken about previously, which was also connecting Greek myth and science? Uh, thank you for this question, because that's, uh, I think my presentation from like, after Prometheus presentation about Archimedes also connects Greek um, classical material with science. So it's coming to a book project right now, I think. Um, and I haven't thought, so this is probably will be the goal for this book to figure out why in, so in some instances of Soviet animation, the technological progress is expressed through the, uh, through, through addre- by addressing to Greek uh, and Roman material. And I have I have a couple of points of um, hypothesis about that. Um, and in fact, not only Prometheus is about technology, but also uh, some of other um, films from the series of uh, uh, of Greek myths. Uh, Greek legends and myth. For example, there is a series about the Argonauts and the sh- and the ship and Argo ship, and it's also about the building of the future. So it's very interesting how the future is uh, uh, addressed through the through through the distant mythological past. And I and I can um, one of hypotheses that technology is always a privilege. Right, and um, there are two main options to use this privilege for for bad and for good, right? And it's important, uh, what, what do we choose at the end? Something like that, <laughs> if, if it makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to. I would love to see this uh, turn into a book project. I think that would be that would be fascinating. It seems like a, a, a really fruitful, a really fruitful angle for you. Um, looking through the questions, we have. Um, let's see. Um, Meredith wants to follow up. She asks, "Is the function of myth to provide 
the moralizing cautionary tale? So I'll just throw that, that out to you, Katerina. Um, it is, and uh, it's important um, uh, to add that very often there is also another layer added to that. Um, as another researcher of um, Soviet animation, Dr. Pavlovsky argued that over the Greek, so the Greek myth is also is a, a is addressed to Soviet audience through the tropes and motives from Russian folk tales. Mm. So there is like this moralizing level of Greek myth through also moralizing aspect of Russian folk tale. Right. And so that, that, that allows the two to merge very nicely, um, right? Because they both have a, a, a kind of shared, you know, etiology or etiological force or impetus behind them. Uh, or didactic, if you'd like. Right. Um, well, we have about maybe three minutes left or so. You know, I don't want to be um, too Martinet about that. Um, we do have to move on to our next venue. Um, but I'm wondering if maybe what we could do is just see if anybody would like to ask a question, just a general question from the audience as opposed to submitting it or, or to make a comment. Just put up a hand and, and I'll call on you. Alice, <laughs> I saw your emoji and then you uh, then I saw your hand. So please go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, I tried to type in my uh, question because I have bronchitis and don't sound so good. Uh -huh. um, I, I, it's, it's largely for David, although I wonder if Eduardo would find it interesting as well. It, um, hearing your really interesting analysis of the way um, games immerse you in um, in this digital ancient world as its touristic enterprise. Um, it made me think of uh, Carla Uhink's um, representation of ancient Greece in modern theme parks. Have you read that? Um, I highly recommend it because I think it really does a great job of theorizing what authenticity means in an artificial environment that's supposed to recreate antiquity. And I was wondering if you thought about that relationship and also maybe to, um, to restorations of actual ancient sites and you know, how, how you make an environment seem real and be real. And it sounds like you, you really brought out nicely that those are not the same things in, in gaming. Hmm. Thank you, Allison. Let's see if David has a response. I'll try to make it brief, but yeah, uh, actually, uh, yeah, the, the, the title you're referring to, thank you for so much for the recommendation, is one of the many members of my list of things to read. But yeah, um, uh, it is, actually there is a connection for, for, the, for both questions, because uh, this, this big difference between authenticity and, and recreation or accuracy, as the typical critics, criticism word for video games, is the very key of, I think, the very key of the a video game having a possibility to be honest in the depiction of antiquity or not. Uh, actually, we are very used to see sentences. I'm talking about the marketing campaigns of video games, sentences like explore ancient Egypt, live the real adventure, uh, get back to the real past of. So I think that at the end of the day, when there is a real intention to try to bring you back to a feeling, a sense or a touch with uh, an environment or a sense of a cultural background more than to how it really was, there is a middle ground where uh, authors can really work in a, let's say, honest way again, because when they are just pretending to make it real, uh, we have seen time and again that the outcome is just a, a massive over, over concentration of elements just to make it clear that you are in that time. It's a little bit like when we watch these movies from the 1980s and they have more elements from the 1980s and people living in the 1980s. There are more cassettes and telephones and things that people really lived in. So this abuse of elements at the end of the day is quite a, a thing to consider in my personal opinion about uh, uh, world construction in video games. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you for the, for the question. Um, we're at 10.30, but uh, Paula, I see you have a question. Well, let this be our, our final question, Paula, if you'd like to ask it. I, I was just, it was really following on from Ekaterina, and I put it in the um, chat bar as well. Oh, I just remember yeah. the 1934 Soviet Writers Conference, and wasn't Gorky saying that um, 
the ancient myths and things like seven league boots and all these things will be realized by technology at some point. And then I was just thinking about Marx. I can't remember if it's the German ideology, but Marx was also saying what, what use of Hermes when you have credit mobilier and things like this. Anyway, just a, just a thought for Katarina. Thank you. I will I will check on the Gorky speech uh, because it's interesting. And in general, Luna Charsky, uh, uh, oh, yes. the comet, um, uh, who was uh, responsible of a dialogical background of culture in yeah. in twenties, Luna Charsky was very very uh, uh, fond in promoting uh, classic yeah. films for theater um, and public performance. Oh, so thank started... you, Katerina. I've got some Lunacharsky somewhere, but it's uh, I'm getting old and it's ages since I've read any. <laughs> thank you for your notes. Thank you, Paula, for that question. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think this will bring us to, uh, unfortunately, the end of our, of, our, of our panel today, but not necessarily the end for our panelists. Panelists, we do have the chat saved and um, we'll get some questions to you that were not asked and, and as well as the ones that were asked. So you just have a record of, 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 of the kind of interest and the kind of things that you might wish to think about as, as you move this work forward. Um, and the last thing I would like to do is just to thank our panelists one more time for a, a great round of papers and a great start to the conference. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.